Father God, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for this time together. We thank you for the body of Christ, those you've risen up, Lord, to serve you and live, you with, live for you, Lord. And how I propose, Lord, that we're talking about that as we go into this book tonight. Father, we ask that you would help me to properly bring forth your word. Give us ears to hear and a heart to receive, Lord. And, Lord, we do lift up our sister Tatiana to you right now, Lord. Father, we pray that you would just be with her through this, through this time of loss. Comfort and strengthen her. Encourage her, Lord, in you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So please open your Bibles as we begin a new book. And the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. <laughs> Malachi. I never heard that before until Byron said it, and I will tell you that I'm going to punch him real hard after the service because as I was going through this, I couldn't, I kept saying, because I was pronouncing it the way it looks, and I kept saying Malachi in my mind as I'm going through this. So thank you, Pastor Byron. Yeah. <laughs> Now, I must say, from a personal standpoint, I have been looking forward to working our way through this book with much anticipation. And we'll talk about that a little later, but this is a book that I have, believe it or not, uh, had a profound effect on me as a young Christian. I mean, like weeks into my relationship with the Lord. But again, we'll, we'll get to that later. A church member scolded her pastor for preaching a series of sermons on the sins of the saints. After all, she argued, the sins of Christians are much different from the sins of the rest of the world, of other people. Yes, he agreed, they are worse. She, I'm sorry, he said, they are worse. They are worse for when we believers sin, they not only break the law of God, but they break the heart of God. When a believer deliberately sins, it isn't just the disobedience of a servant to a master or the rebellion of a subject against a king. It's the offense of a child against a loving father. The sins we cherish and the things that we think we get away with bring grief to the heart of our God. Malachi was called to perform a difficult and dangerous task. It was his responsibility to rebuke the people for the sins they were committing against God and against one another and to call them to return to the Lord. Malachi took a wise approach. He anticipated the objections of the people and met them head on. This is what God says, he's, the prophet would say, but you say, and then he would answer their complaints. The Old Testament prophets were often the only people in the community who had a grip on reality and saw things as they actually were. And that's what made them so unpopular. Blanchard wrote this, quote, it is possible to read Malachi in less than 10 minutes, but impossible to read it comfortably as, it, as, as its message is as powerful and disturbing now as it was when first written, end quote. Fur writes in his introduction, quote, Malachi may speak to the modern reader with greater relevancy than any of the other minor prophets. Although Malachi reflects on ancient settings, it is easy for the modern reader to identify with the issues of the book, end quote. Now, as the prophet meditates between, mediates between God and his people, the reader is invited to listen to a series of hypothetical conversations. One quickly discovers that the conversations with God are not unlike our own conversations. Their apathy is like our apathy. Their excuses are like our excuses. Yes, there is an emphasis on ancient interests in the book, covenant, the priesthood, the Mosaic law, yet the principles within, the, um, within Malachi are ready, readily applicable 
to the modern world. Relevant content permeates the book. Malachi affirms the love of God for his elect. Therefore, the elect are called to love God. He reminds the priests to offer their sacrifice with discernment, knowing that God discerns between the righteous and the wicked. Later, the prophet calls upon the men of Judah to watch their ways, knowing that God is watching as well. He exhorts the people to return to God, and with that, God will return to them. After all, in his faithfulness, God did not leave them, but rather, they left him. And we know that's true even today, right? God never walks away from us. It's always us who turn our back on him. The prophet rebukes the people for robbing God of what belongs to him. In turn, God rebukes the curse that plagued their economic prosperity. Finally, in the last stages of the book, the reader is called to remember the instructions of Moses, knowing that God remembers the righteous and will by no means forget the wicked on the day of judgment. Indeed, the hypothetical conversations mediated by this last of the Old Testament prophets are not unlike those of today. I personally have maintained throughout our study of the minor prophets how impeccable God's timing is. It seems as though no matter where we have been in our study of the minor prophets, we could see a reflection of current events. I think back to a year and a half ago, 19 months ago, when this whole COVID thing started, it seemed like God was setting us up and preparing us for what was coming ahead as we were going through the minor prophets. The relevancy of Malachi, in fact, all the minor prophets, has been something that I have been stressing throughout our time in the minor prophets. All one needs to do is look at the daily news and then read the books of the Bible to understand and see the relevancy of the word of God to our world today. Despite what those say, despite what those who say the Bible is, isn't relevant for today, that is an antiquated book, I completely disagree. All one needs to do is open their eyes and see the importance of this book yesterday, today, and for tomorrow. It is as if, as if God is telling us to look and see that the events of, this past, of the past are very relevant for today. Open your eyes and ears. Don't miss what I'm trying to show you. Don't miss what I'm trying to say to you. We're all familiar with 2 Timothy 3, 16, where it says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. This book is called the living word of God. It's not dead. It's not a dusty old book. Though for some of us, it may be that way because we set it up on the shelf and don't read it. But it's not. It's the living word of God. It's active. It's real. It's relevant. But I digress. I had a whole thing and I was going to go off on a tangent, but I've reined it in. <laughs> the book of Malachi is a reminder of how God's people allowed the worldly thinking of their day, instead of their reverence for God, determine their behavior. Again, look in the mirror. The name Malachi means my messenger, and he was the last messenger of God, the last prophet of God until John the Baptist came on the scene. God was silent for some 400 years until he raised up John the Baptist. And that silence was then broken. And John the Baptist broke that silence by saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 3, 2. In fact, the book of Malachi closes with the promise of Elijah coming to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. And John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah, preparing the way for the Messiah, 
our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Strangely enough, some believe that the prophecy of Malachi is anonymous and that the name is merely a title for Ezra or some other writer. Some church fathers even thought that the writer, the writer was an angel, since in Greek and Hebrew, the same word can mean angel or messenger. Written in about 400 BC, the book of Malachi brings down the curtain on the Old Testament. And as the curtain comes down, the voice of God rings out. Did you know of the 55 verses that comprise the book, 47 are spoken by God directly. That's a higher percentage than that of any other book of the Bible. Malachi is the only prophet to end his prophecy with a warning. Other prophets ended on a high note of hope. But Malachi, the Old Test with Malachi, the Old Testament closes with a warning because it's setting the stage for the blessing, the redemptive work of Jesus Christ as seen in the first book of the New Testament, Matthew. Now, it had been a hundred years since Zechariah and Haggai had been on the scene encouraging the people of Judah to finish the work of reconstruction reconstructing the temple that had been destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. Zechariah and Haggai encouraged the people to return to the work, and the people responded. The temple was built, rebuilt, and the walls restored. Yet success had its own dangers because after the temple was rebuilt and the walls restored, the people began to kick back a bit. They wanted to take a look. Hey, we put in a lot of work. Let's take it easy for a little while. But as they did this, as with all of us, when you kick back like that, you begin to lose some of your spiritual edge, don't you? They be began to lose the fire and passion. A mediocrity had crept into them. And isn't that true? with Christians today, when we kick back and we sort of, we don't, we don't spend as much time reading in the morning or having our quiet time. We can skip a day, but we skip a day. We say, well, now, you know what? I don't need to read on Thursdays. But Thursday becomes Wednesday too. And Wednesday becomes Friday. And pretty soon now we're reading less. We're reading one day a week, if at all. I don't need to pray. I pray every day. Come on, I can take a break. God understands, right? He understands. So we kick back and we spend a little less time in prayer, serving, watching sports and TV when we should be at church. God understands. The Cowboys are on a roll. He knows I can't miss that game. <laughs> now, you notice I didn't say Redskins because we don't, there's no more Redskins, so. <laughs> but a measure of comfort and security under Persian overlords encouraged the people of Judah to let their hands fall in their task of building their nation under God. So the Lord sent Malachi to speak to his people concerning the lukewarm state of their hearts. Life was not easy. The Jews were under political dom uh, dominion of the Persians. Harvests were poor and subject to locust damage. We'll see that when we get into, the, into chapter 3. Most hearts were indifferent or resentful towards God. Both the priests and the people were violating the stipulations of, of the Mosaic law regarding sacrifice, tithes, and offerings. The people's hope in God's covenant promise had dimmed, as evident by their intermar uh, intermarriages with pagans, divorces, and general moral uh, ambivalence. Ablival Nothing much is known of Malachi on a personal level, apart from what we see in this book. Some scholars even deny that Malachi is a separate book, but affirm that it is actually only the last of three sections of Zechariah 
which were cut off in order to make the minor prophets amount to the sacred number 12. Though Josephus mentions all the major characters of this period, he failed to include Malachi among them. The total obscurity of the author of the book is underlined by the absence of the name Malachi in all the rest of the Bible. Even where he is quoted in the New Testament, his name does not appear. For example, Matthew chapter 11, verse 10 says, For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before you, before your face, who will prepare your way before you. This is from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. This is also found in Mark chapter 1, verse 2, and uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 27. Yet nowhere is it attributed to Malachi. On the positive side, each of the other writing prophets is named in the opening verses of his book. If a man named Malachi did not write the book bearing this name, he would be the only exception. Moreover, Malachi is neither an unlikely name nor an unsuitable one for the author of this last book of the prophets. After all, Malachi was the Lord's messenger his trumpet made no uncertain sound. Clearly and unmistakably, he indicted his people and the priests for their sins and summoned them to righteousness. The burden of this, the last of the Old Testament prophets, was the glaring inconsistency between the identity of the Jewish community as a people of God and the living out of all that, we, uh, all of the, that this required of them. This was not the problem of, there, there was not the problem of the rebuilding of the temple and the holy silly city that had long been done by Malachi's day. Rather, it was the issue of holy living and holy service in the aftermath of all the external accomplishments. As one commentator put it, quote, Malachi, though dead, yet speaks to the modern world about the need to bring performance into line with profession. His message, therefore, is current, especially in light of the coming of the one of whom the prophet so eloquently spoke. As you read through this book, the time period of Ezra and Nehemiah seem to come to the forefront. The same things these prophets spoke against the Jews, so too did Malachi. Ezra's ministry was, about, was around 458 B.C. and Nehemiah around 445 B.C., which would put Malachi sometime after these prophets as they moved further and further away from God. But just to give you an example of what was going on during this time period, keep your finger here in Malachi and turn for a minute to Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah chapter 13, please. We're going to begin reading in verse 23. Nehemiah 13, verse 23. It says, In those days I also saw that the Jews had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. As for the children... <clears throat> excuse me, half, of, half spoke in the language of Ashdod, and none of them was able to speak the language of Judah, but the language of his own people. So I contended with them and cursed them and struck some of them and pulled out their hair and made them swear by God, you shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor take of their daughters for your sons or for yourself. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin regarding these things, yet among the nations, I'm sorry, yet among the many nations, there was no king like him, and he was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, the foreign women caused even him to sin. 
do we then hear about you that you have committed all this great evil <clears throat> by acting unfaithfully against our God by marrying foreign women? Even, the one, even one of the sons of Jodiah and the son Elisheb, the high priest, was a son-in-law of Sanblat the Heronite. So I drove him away from me. Remember them, O oh my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Thus I purified them from everything foreign and appointed duty, duties for the priests and the Levites, each in his task. And I arranged for the supply of wood at, at appointed times and for the first fruits. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. As we can see, Nehemiah was a tough guy. He struck those living in rebellion, pulled out their hair. Nehemiah would not be a counselor today, would he? <laughs> I don't think Nehemiah could have gotten away with pulling out people's hair as they sat across the table from him or punching them. Though I'm still going to punch Byron for Malachi. <laughs> Nevertheless, he did get his point across. So this was the situation that was facing Malachi, spiritual apathy. So God sends his messenger to awake the people and get them back on track. I pray that we would be the that would be the results for us as we move forward in our study of this book, beginning with me. I don't want to lose that fire and that hope, that, that desire to serve and to live for him. I want to always be on fire. More of him and less of me. Yes? Malachi really is the last of the old in the anticipation of the new. Moore wrote of Malachi, quote, it is the transition linked between the two great dispensations of redemption. The last note of that magnificent classical of revelation, whose wailing of sorrow and breathing of hope were soon to give place to that rich song, which should be not only of Moses, but also of the Lamb, and tell not only of Eden and Sinai, but also of Calvary and heaven, end quote. This book is not just for those living in Malachi's day. It's relevant for us today. In doing some research for this, this study tonight, I came across something that I want to share with you guys I thought was very interesting. Let's see if I can get this up. Oh, my computer just went off. Did it? Wow, it did. Okay, that's okay. I have it on. The great thing about this is we have it up here, right, Dave? Let's see if I can find it. Uh, where'd it go? As I was doing research and I was going through uh, 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 looking up stuff for Malachi, I ran across this article. Believe it or not, I found this article in the Jewish Journal. The title of the article is The High Holy Days. Something meaningful, meaningful or just going through the motions? I'm just going to read you a little bit of this article, okay? I think it's relevant to where we are in this introduction. It says, most of us go to synagogue for the high holy days, have no clue what's going on. We don't speak or read Hebrew well enough to understand the prayers or the uh, Torah portion. We don't know why we say the prayers in the order we say them. We don't like the stilted English translation. Many of us don't even believe in God or religion. It is true, Jews are the least religion of all adherents. Really? Jews? God's chosen people? According to Gallup, 
only 38% of us consider ourselves religious, while 54% of us self-describe as non-religious and 2% as atheists. These are Jews, God's chosen people. Meanwhile, almost 80% attend synagogue on the high holy days. To summarize, most of us spend a dozen hours in synagogue and hundreds of dollars on tickets to pray in a language we don't understand to a God we don't believe in. Why? The answer is, for a lot of different reasons. Some Jews, of course, do understand and do believe, so that's a lock. Many of us are groping our way towards understanding and belief. Others like their tradition, others like their tradition and the feeling of community, the chance to hear a sermon, the feeling that we get participating in a ritual. Many go out of guilt or habit or superstition. I suspect that it's often a mix of these motives that compel us in varying amounts depending on the year. Anyway, who said you have to understand what's going on in order to be, to be moved? <laughs> really? <laughs> really? These are Jews. <sighs> you don't need to understand it or play. I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. Anyway, who said you have to understand what's going on in order to be moved? Ritual is a human desire, like music. You don't need to understand it or play it or believe in it to be changed by it. Really. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read the entire article, but let me drop down to the end. Okay, I practice this word, but I know, I know I'm gonna mispronounce it, Byron. It's a Jewish word. Teshuva means returning. The high holy days are an elaborate extent, extended ritual of return to get us to turn back towards our true selves, toward what we know is right, toward what believers would call God, listen to this, toward what, towards what believers, that's you, us, would call God and what the rest would call our essence. <laughs> our human longing to return to the source is fully, a, fully part of the natural order Rabbi Arthur Green writes, we are born to be God seekers. Okay. This is not a Jewish thing. It's a human thing. Judaism offers a way. That's the reason so many of us find ourselves stepping into synagogues at this time of year. It's our outward response to our inward call. 2,000, 2000 years later, not Leonardo, not Edison, not even Elon Musk. The, in the middle of the article, they talked about Teslas and stuff like that. Anyway, has improved on the desire of the so far. We go because we have a feeling that while it may not in, in I'm sorry, we go because we have a feeling that while it may not in and of itself work or even make much sense, it is a step in the right direction. It helps. We live in a society whose every moment and every message tells us, getting moving, get moving, go forward. The time of year sometimes calls, us, calls out to us from within and says, here is a better idea. Stop and go deeper. These are Jews. God's chosen people. Something's missing, huh? They had lost their way in Malachi's day. These words are very much for us today as people, as people have a form of godliness, they are very religious, but they deny the power and they deny Jesus. They may use his name, but they don't have that intimate relationship with him because apart from repenting of your sins and asking Jesus to your life, you are still dead in your trespasses and sins. 
Sin still separates you from God. James Montgomery Boyce, Boyce put it like this. Malachi is interesting for another reason also. It is true that it is a link between the old covenant and the new, between Judaism and Christianity. But in describing the Judaism of Malachi's day, the book also vividly describes the stagnant religiosity of an era, including our own. We can go further. Perhaps more than any other Old Testament book, Malachi describes that modern attitude of mind that considers man superior to God and that he that and that has the audacity to attempt to bring God down to earth and measure him by the yardstick of human morality. We're guilty today. This book is relevant for today. It's important that we understand and read and study this book today. The Lord not only wanted outward compliance with the law, but an inward acceptance as well. The prophet assaulted the corruption, wickedness, and false security by directing his judgment at their hypocrisy, infidelity, compromise, divorce, false worship, and arrogancy. Malachi's message as a prophetic word of God was, once, was one of rebuke and indictment of each of these ills and across the social spectrum, a message that ended, however, with a note of ultimate hope. The Savior was coming. Jesus is coming. McKay writes, quote, in a series of disputes, the man of God called to account all the guilty, challenging them to face up to and confess their sins to the Lord of the covenant before whom in fact, they stood in arraignment. His word is strong and passionate and unrelenting, for he lived in critical times. Unless he could get his message across, there was a real and imminent danger that all the gains of post-exilic renewal would be irrevocably lost. As the last of Israel's chromatic heralders, Malachi reached back to the beginning of her covenant election and forward to the promise of the covenant fulfilled bridging the two with his un urgent insistence that the theocratic people be worthy of their calling for the king of all the earth was at hand, end quote. This is what Malachi had to do. This was the message that he had to bring forth to his people. They had become lazy, lackluster. They had lost their fire and their love for the Lord. May it never be true of any of us. God forbid. I always want to be on fire. And I know that, I know that I'm, I'm guilty of this too. I know there are days when my flesh takes over and says, don't worry about it. It's okay. You, pray. you know, when I ask people about do they pray, they say, well, I do pray. I pray every day. I pray over my food. Really? <laughs> okay. But this is the extent of what we, we, we consider to be prayer. This tells us who we are, what have we have become. We're considering praying over our food as the extent of our, our, our life of prayer. Again, I go off on a tangent. The book of Malachi is made up of superscripture, six disputations between Malachi, God, and the addressees or his people. The six disputations are a dispute about God's love, a dispute about God's honor and fear, a dispute about faithfulness, a dispute about God's justice, a dispute about repentance, and finally a dispute about speaking against God. And one can easily see that the prophet's concern was to reassure his people that God still loved them. The post-exilic period was a discouraging time for the people who returned to Jerusalem from Babylon with such high hopes. The prophets in Isaiah chapter 40 through 40, 55 
paint the picture of the future of, of, these, of those uh, repatriated people in such a glowing terms that they expected the Messianic age to dawn immediately. Real quick, turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, please. We're just going to look at the first 10 verses just to give you an example of what they were expecting once they returned to the promised land, to Jerusalem. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1. It says, Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice is calling. Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, call out. Then he answered, what shall I call out? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord is blown upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Get yourself up on a high, on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and, he is, and his recompense before him. Haggai and Zechariah added to these hopes by assuring the people that if they would rebuild the temple, the glory of the Lord would come with unprecedented blessings. They built the temple and waited and waited, but there was no glory. Instead, there was famine, poverty, oppression, unfaithfulness to marriage vows and to covenant vows. Morally and spiritually laxity, laxity pride, indifference, permissiveness, and skepticism were widespread. They had lost their way. They wanted their cake and to eat it too, as my mother would say. Malachi tried to rekindle the fire of faith in the hearts of his discouraged people. He assured his people that Yahweh still loved them, that the covenant was still in force. But God expected them to honor and fear him as, submitted, as a submitted party to a covenant it's feared and honored. God expected faithfulness on the part of the people in covenant with him and with one another. God defended his justice by saying that he was coming to purge and purify the Levitical priests and to judge the guilty sinners among his people. The people should repent of their evil deeds and of their wrong attitudes before he returns. If they repent, he will pour out on them an unprecedented blessing. But there was no sign of repentance. Murmuring against God are heard. However, there were some God-fearers and encouragers um, who encouraged one another in faithfulness. These are God's special possessions and will sp be spared in the day of judgment. If they do not return, he will come and smite the land with a curse. Since the last words of this book is one of judgment, it should claim the calm the attitude of everyone who reads it. I had a quote that I wanted to read from Spurgeon, but I'll add it to next week. Nevertheless, at to sum it all up, they had lost their way. They had lost their fire. They had lost their desire. The Jews living in Jerusalem were just getting through the, going through the motions in their worship. When Malachi arrived on the scene, he addressed the Jews who had returned to the land after living in exile for 70 years. They had rebuilt the temple and reestablish the worship of God. Externally, 
everything seemed okay, but inwardly, a cancer of complacency ate away at their community. As God's final spokesman prior to John the Baptist, Malachi arrives to challenge God's people. Repent. Rekindle that fire that was supposed to be there, your love for the Lord. Brothers and sisters, I pray that we would always have that fire and that zeal and that desire to live for Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's all I have for tonight. Next week, we'll get into the Word. Let's all stand. I love being saved. I love being saved. And I pray that that love would grow more and more with each passing day. Guys, listen. The one thing I know about Anna was she was saved. And you know what? Tiffany and I were talking about this. There's a sense of jealousy because she's standing before the Lord. She sees her Savior. I want to see Jesus. How about you? Amen? Father God, we thank you. We love you. We praise you. We adore you. You are great and awesome and mighty and wonderful. Oh, what an awesome God you are. Lord, help us to do better. With each passing day, Lord, we want to draw closer and closer to you, to be more intimate with you, Father, we need you now more than we've ever needed you before. We thank you. I ask you to bless each and every person here. See us safely home until we come together again. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.